Scripture said, in times past, you were not a people, but now, but now, the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God has been so good to us. I'm telling you that the infilling of the Holy Ghost is the greatest gift you could ever have. Amen. Sitting out here in this sanctuary, sitting in sanctuaries around the world right now, are people that understand the pain that this poor demonic man endured. There's people that have gone through that kind of sorrow, agony. Some of them are sitting right here this morning. And uh, when you see people out there on the streets living broken lives, those, and I, I've got one particular man in mind that I've seen near Harbor Freight many times, constantly muttering to himself, constantly talking, and uh, it's loud enough that everybody else can hear it as well. And he's got involuntary jerks uh, that, that, uh, that mess with his physical, his body. And oftentimes, you look at them, they're unclean, haven't got washed clothes, they're, they're uncouth. They're repugnant as far as that kind of life is concerned. Uh, one thing I've got to remind myself is don't be too harsh you know, with them because you don't know, I don't know, what put them on that path to hopelessness. We don't know because it had not been for the mercies and the goodness of God, some of us could be out there doing the very same things that they're doing. And here's what hit me. The reasons why many of them are out there are so varied. They're so particular and unique, but yet they're strangely uniform at the same time because it's the accumulation of poor choices that have put them where, many of them where they're at. It was, it was that rebellious act as a teenager, it was that it was the first usage of the gateway drugs. It was the beginning of some of those things that they sought out some pleasure. And who knows why that they sought for the relief from that, that pressure that they might have been under. But but just some dumb mistakes, just just uh, losing their temper and, and being thrust out. Who knows? What kind of poor choices that they may have been made. But we make our choices and we are made by our choices. Many of them are victims of abuse. Some of the ladies out there have been physically abused by this world. Strapped down with, the, with the, the, the ropes and the chains of drugs to keep them manipulable. And then when they're finished with them, they toss them away. Used up, out of their minds, dealing with a life that is shattered, blown out, messed up, and they're, they're out there in that kind of stuff. Some of them, I'm thinking of one particular man, Tucson, Arizona. He lived behind the little wall that uh, hit the air conditioning unit. And they found him living there, but he didn't bother anybody, and they left him there for, for many, many years, actually. He had been a professor of mathematics, but something happened within his family. I think it was an accident. His wife died. His mind snapped. Some of them are out there because of a job loss. They couldn't find another. Eventually, they got kicked out of their home, ended up on the streets. Who knows what, what kind of a blow that may have hit them and thrown them into a place of hopelessness. But at the same time, 
in the myriad reasons that they could be out there living the tormented life. At the same time, there's, there's a uniformity to it. The hopelessness is what you feel when you are so far away from God. Where is God? Why don't God answer my prayers? Why, why can't he help me? Why? Just, just that sense of life is over and life is messed up. Who knows what opened up the gateway in this particular man to the demonic spirits? Who knows what he may have gotten involved in? More that likely than not, he was reaching for a false hope. Something to alleviate the pain. Something to stop the agony and the torment that he was going through. I don't know what it was, but I'll tell you what I do know. It was not mere insanity. It was not a psychological problem that just threw him off his edge. Some have supposed that when the Bible talks about demon possession, that what it actually is is some kind of psychosis that they go through as if you could go to a psychiatrist, sit on a couch, and let him figure out that you were spanked too many times when you were a kid. That you've got repressed emotions that have caused you what it was. It was not just that his mind snapped over the pressure of stress. It was not something like that. It was not physical and it was not mental. It was not a situation like a medical issue like epilepsy or some other disease of the nerves. It was nothing like that. It was demon possession. Now, I want you to understand something. You don't play with the demon. You don't toy with it. Let me tell you something. You don't pick up Ouija boards. You don't go to seances. You don't play around with the tarot cards. You don't go check out the woman that can tell you your future because those open you up to demonic spirits. We don't know what caused him. To get that way, I remember stories by my dear friend Randy Adams of things that he had seen in Africa and the amazing things that demonic spirits can do. But I want you to understand something. This man was tormented by it. He was obsessed with death. Have you ever noticed the demonic things always associate themselves with the grave, with death, with horror, with torment. He was so obsessed with death, he lived among the tombs. The tombs were the place where he felt like he could, he could live in peace in a place like that. The Bible said he stripped off all of his clothes. He, he, was, he was naked uh, most of the time. I remember driving through... Uh, the streets of Cotonou, uh, Benin, West Africa with Brother Adams. And in the river there, there was a woman and she had absolutely not a stitch of clothes on. And, uh, and, and he told us, and it's sad to see something like that because he told us, he said many times when we see somebody like that, they are literally possessed with a devil. We were driving out to a funeral, out among the bush, and literally outside of a town at a graveside, there was a man that looked horrible, filthy, dirty, screaming, living among the tombs. And this story came to life to me. They tried to restrain him. They tried to bind him down to where he wouldn't harm himself or anybody else. But somehow that frail body still broke off the chains that they bound him with. You don't do that in human weakness or human strength. You do that because something supernatural has gotten a hold of them. They would listen to him at nighttime. The tormented screams in the night. 
the wailing that would go on in the night, the tormented spirit that was out there. And uh, they feared him. They feared. They told their children, don't you go near that place because you know what he's like. And he was out there in the dark until the day that he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And when Jesus showed up, every bit of the pain, every bit of the suffering was gone. (laughs) But Jesus, I pray that today as I meander my way through this, that some of you will remember the day that he walked down your dusty road and he called you out. Remind you of the time that he said there is a way. You don't have to live like this. You can live beyond that kind of lifestyle. The man, listen to me, the man came running to Jesus. The Bible said he was coming to worship him. The spirits that was in the man began to fear Jesus because they cried out and said, Why have you come? Have you come to torment us before our time? He came to worship They knew the game was up. They knew it was over when Jesus showed up. Because demons can't stay where Jesus shows up. They can't can't stay in there. You see, the scripture lets us know that even the demons know that there is one God. And that they tremble. Because the devil knows the truth. He's, He's jockeying for some kind of popularity contest. He's, he's jockeying for some kind of power and control. But how do you kill an almighty God? How do you stop the God that calls everything into existence? How, how can the creation overcome the creator? It cannot happen. The devils knew it was over. I'm going to skip some. I'm not going to over-preach about the, 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 the demons going into the pigs and the pigs cast themselves off and all that kind of stuff. All I can tell you is, obviously, there was a group of sightseers out of town. They, they, they found out something had been going on. They, they, somebody may have say, said, hey, your pigs are running towards the ocean. Who knows what it was? But when they showed up, there was a different man talking to Jesus than the one they had known. If you could have seen where I was at and where I could have been, if I could only see where you were at and what you were headed towards, it was a collision course on the way to happen. But God, but God shows up. Hallelujah. I wonder, I wonder to myself if those if those sightseers, knowing Jesus had showed up, maybe somebody had seen the demonic running towards him, I bet they thought, man, we're in for a fight. We're going to see another one that this man decimates. We're in for a show. Another one bites the dust. But when they got there, it wasn't Jesus beaten up. It was a whole legion of devils that got dunked in the sea. They were the ones that got beaten up. The man that had been tormented by them, he was sitting calmly having a conversation with Jesus. And the Bible said he was clothed and he was in his right mind. <laughs> Woo! Have you, ever, have you ever gotten so confused in your mind, so messed up in your mind that you don't know which way's up and which way's down, but you come to the house of God? David said, my feet well nigh slipped when I looked and saw the, 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 uh, the wickedness of the, the, how, how they did so well. But he said, when I went into the sanctuary of the house of God, suddenly I realized it's not my feet that are on slippery places, uh, but it's their feet. I well nigh slipped. But when I began to understand uh, that really when I got in the presence of God, uh, I'm not the one that's messed up. They're the ones that are messed up. Somebody shout amen. Amen. He'll take a messed up mind and transform it through the power of the Holy Ghost. 
Can I hear an amen? amen? Has anybody here ever been touched like that? Woo! Now, that was my introduction. That's why I had to reserve myself a little bit. Because once that miracle had taken place, and once that man got delivered, oh, friend, I, I told, I told the, uh, the young people that take care of the sign, and I'm so grateful and appreciative that they have faithfully done that. I said, it's time to change the sign. We need to put up something new. I said, I want something about deliverance and hope because that's what I'm feeling in my spirit. I know that there are people in this city that need absolute deliverance. Deliverance not only over sin, but the enemy. Some of them are possessed by a devil, and they need that devil driven out, cast out, where it will never come back. Come on, somebody. They need some habits broken. They need a miracle in their life. And when you've been messed up and bound by sin and you get the Holy Ghost and you feel the liberty of the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you it is joy, unspeakable joy. You get the feeling, you get the feeling like David when you really fall in love with the things of God. You want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You're not one of those that are saying, it's 8.15, it's 8.20, pastor, I got to work tomorrow. No, there's something, there's something about it. When, when you are so enthralled with the Holy Ghost, some of you remember your new convert days and some of you need to go back and revisit your new convert days. Because there is joy in the house of the Lord. And I'm telling you, you get in that atmosphere, you don't want it to ever stop. It's like, oh, do I have to go home? It's when you leave, you're, you're, you're coming back already. You're leaving, coming back. In your spirit, you can hardly wait for the next church service. In your spirit, you're going to find some way to get back into that presence. Oh, God, I wish it would never leave us. I wish it would stay with us because of such joy in his presence. But one of the beautiful secrets on our side is we could carry him with us wherever we go. But this man watched Jesus climb into that ship. And he began to look around and remember his environment. And he told Jesus, I want to travel with you. I want to go with you and the disciples. Don't leave me to myself who knows the insecurity of, of his fears and all the things as he began to think of what he was going to deal with. The things that people knew about him. The, the, the ones around the gatherings that were upset with him because their pigs died. Come on now. People back home that remembered how he used to be and what he did, all the mistakes that he made, the pain and the disappointment that he caused them. I'm going to tell you in the Holy Ghost right now, I feel, I feel led in this to tell you in the Holy Ghost, some of your children, they don't want to come back because they're ashamed to tell you, face you with the pain that they have caused you. I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. I'm telling somebody, you're going to have to release them of that pain. You're going to have to grant mercy to some things. Mm. All, all of the things that were just heavy upon him, when he realized everybody knows what I've done. They, they, I, if I could just go somewhere else and have a fresh start where nobody knew my mistakes Nobody, if I could just be in the presence of the deliverer all the time, if I, if I could just do that, it would be so easy. But Jesus looked at him and said, no, you need to go home. Because you've got some friends back home that need the same message you've got. 
you got some people back there that know who you were, and they need to see what you are. Oh, come on. There's people that need you to tell them what the Lord has done for you. You need to tell your testimony of how I was a mess and God turned me into a message. How I was always doing the wrong thing, but God gave me the grace of God where I could do the right thing. You need to tell them about the mercy and the goodness of God. Somebody tell them your testimony. I am preaching to a congregation of miracles this morning. I am preaching to people that God has been so good to and has done so much for. You get to hear me expose some of the secrets of my life. But the truth of the matter is, it's not just the preacher. And I've not lived the life that you live. And I don't have the connections to the community that you connect to. Uh, I'm telling you, somebody has got to tell them uh, what the Lord has done for them. Somebody shout amen. Amen. You've got a testimony that others need to hear. Years ago, Brother Gordon Mallory, how many of you remember Brother Mallory? Brother Mallory started this when he was in Puyallup, Washington, pastoring the church up there. He, he, he literally got people to start writing down their testimony. And they made personalized tracks, not from headquarters, not from, not from the drug uh, rehab group in the UPC. Not from people that, that, that they were way off. He, he made them or had them write down their own testimony. He printed them up and they started handing out their tracts, their testimony. Let me tell you what God did for me. Let me tell you where I was at. I was in the same shoes you are in right now. But I'm telling you, don't, you have to continue living that way. What a powerful witness when they know you and know where you are at. And they've seen the difference inside of you. I feel so limited sometimes. I, I, pastoring here, I, I pray that you're so merciful and kind to me, which you are. I can't speak Spanish hardly more than taco and burrito. And a few other things. Enough to tell some of our dear ladies how much I care for them. But that's about all I know how to talk to. I can't do some of the, some of the other things. I, I'm limited when I get into that kind of a conversation. I've never, I've never been addicted to drugs. I can't tell you what it's like to come off of drugs. I can't tell you what it's like to be bound to alcohol. I can't tell you some of the things like that. I can't do it. I've never ran with a gang. Well, besides church gangs. I've never, I've never been involved in those kind of things. I, I've never had uh, a messed up marriage. I've, I've ne- I've, God's been gracious to me. I've never had the kind of things uh, that where people have suffered some of the things that they, you've had to go through. I, I don't have that witness, but there's people sitting on these pews today that God has been so good that they have overcome those things. There's people sitting here today that God has healed them of cancer. I get to thinking of Mama Marie sitting right here. And a few years ago, she had a health issue that should have taken her out. But she's still here today because God turned around and healed her. I think about, I think about Sophie, Sister, sister uh, uh, Betty. I think about the fact that she shouldn't be here. If the world had its way, she would have been aborted feces somewhere. But God, I'm telling you, but God... I, I want to tell this world that you are sitting in the midst of a people that know the miracle working power of God. Hallelujah. Woo. And in the book of Revelations, 
<laughs> I got to tell it. I got to tell it. In the book of Revelation, that old devil, that old worm, the devil, that one, that one that has bluffed us, making him feel like he's really somebody. The Bible said we're going to look upon him and we're going to realize, is that the one? Are you kidding me? Is that all he was? Because he doesn't have anything again to, to a child of God. But that devil was defeated by two things. Revelations 12 and verse 1. They overcame him. Number one, by the blood of the lamb. Number two, by the word of their testimony. Somebody shout hallelujah. They, the Bible said they love not their lives unto debt. You can do whatever you want to to this body. It doesn't matter. It doesn't belong to me in the first place. And whatever you do to me, it doesn't matter anyway because I win. If I die with cancer, I win. If I die with the rapture, I win. It doesn't matter what happens. God is going to resurrect this body and I'm going to live with him for eternity. Do whatever you got to do. Do whatever you want to do. I am an overcomer. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. I was in a pit, but he brought me out of the miry clay. I'm telling you, I've got something to shout about. And I want other people to know that they can have the same thing. They can take away your life, but they can't take away your testimony. It's, it's like, it's like the, 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 the Sadducees, Pharisees, Sanhedrin court trying to make that the parents of that, that, uh, that blind man that got his miracle make him say something different. They said, I can't tell it. You, you go ask him. He said, I, he said, I don't know how, who it was. I don't know how it happened. All I know is I was blind, and now I see. All I know is there is a God that is still in the miracle working business. You know, and no one can take it from you. You know what the Lord has done from you. You see, and here's my point. There's many other people in the city of Dinuba, Reedley, Orosi, Cutler, wherever we reach out to. There's many other people out there that are in the same situation that you were in originally. Same thing that tried to destroy, destroy you is trying to destroy them. They need hope. You may be the only voice that can reach them. I was driving down a road between Jackson, Fayette, Mississippi. Came to a town called Hermanville. It's not really much of a town, it's just a bunch of shacks out there in the woods a few buildings on the main highway most of them juke joints anybody know what a juke joint is i don't know what you call them out here outside of a bar but a bar is too upscale up to class for a juke joint juke joints just people where they they gather and get drunk and play pool and everything else that they can do well it's about like a bar there was probably 30, 40 people huddled out in front of there talking. Young man that was with me, we were going to a church. It was actually Port Gibson. We were going there to preach that night. I was. We were talking about, I'd actually entered into this subject knowing we were fixing to drive through Hermanville. When we got there, I looked at those people and I said, what do you think they would do? if I stopped the car and went out there and tried to talk to him. He said, they'd wonder which, which agency you're with. They wouldn't know if you was fed or fuzz or 
who you're there to bust. They wouldn't trust me, but I'm going to tell you who they would have trusted. It was that young black man that was with me because he could have walked in there and could have been right because he grew up in that midst and he knew where they came from. You see, there's some people I can reach you can't reach, but there's a whole lot of them I'll never reach, but you can. You may be the only voice that is able to reach them. Your light may shine bright on the dark backdrop of their past. It may be what exactly what they need. They need to know that there's somebody that has come out of it and has changed. And you are a living witness of what God can do. So as much as you want to go with him, as much as you wish the rapture would go ahead and take you right now, as much as you wish you could live in the house of God and be cloistered and be in the presence of the Lord all the time, the only way we can reach the world is to go teach all nations because they need what you've got. Let's stand together, shall we? Praise God. Your neighborhood needs you. Your friends from your past need you. People that you used to run with, they need you. People that saw you in the middle of the storm, they need you. Anybody here that needs to be set free, I want to tell you the power of God is here to deliver you and set you free. There's not a devil in hell big enough to stop you from coming to God. And there's not a devil that can stand in the, in the face of God. When, when God shows up, they've got to flee. At the name of Jesus, demons are going to flee. need hope, there's hope here today. There's deliverance here today. But for the rest of you, I'm calling you to a place of commitment. God, if I have to write it down so I get all the words right, I'll do it. But I am not going to shut my mouth. I'm not going to respond to peer pressure. I'm not going to respond to intimidation. I've got to do what God's called me to do. I've got to reach into my past and help them go into my future. Come on, let's run to an altar. Let's talk to God. Would you make your way up here to pray and spend some time at the feet of Jesus?
touch that you guys will never know and there's people that you can touch that I will never know but together we can do mighty things through Christ amen greet one another in Jesus name as you're being dismissed amen let's not forget to support the the Spanish department with their freedom boats and we'll be back in church with prayer 5:30 this evening we'll see everybody tonight <laughs>